Okay, so the, the, the stupid question is how to implement uh, a DSL or more specifically how to implement this simple DSL for finite state machines. I mean, it's like a question we all face uh, when we select the technology, maybe also when we do teaching. And so this is about like, you may be like a fluent API, maybe some visual syntax, maybe projectional editing instead, some texture syntax, right? So we might wonder how to do it. There are so many approaches, how to compare them. And uh, so this is our answer to this question. We have a crestomity, it's called Metalib, Metalib, and it's basically collecting all kinds of implementations of the same DSL in a systematic manner. So what you see here is already the web-based view on a particular implementation, in fact, on a particular snippet. So this is one snippet from one implementation. Very important point is that all these implementations are really systematically organized in the sense that we use annotations to add sort of semantic knowledge to all the components of the implementation. Uh, I will say more about this, of course. Um, and then all these, uh, all the terminology that we use in order to give semantic meaning to the implementations organized on a semantic wiki. All right, let's get more into this. Um, so there's a what to, to Metalib. So what are we uh, actually collecting in Metalib? And there's also how we collect it, I will say about it. And then I should also say a little bit more about why we do it, right? Okay, so the what, the, here's the what. So basically this is a simple list of contributions uh, that we included into the paper. Um, so you immediately recognize some of the popular technologies like Xtext and PS and also usage of uh, mainstream program languages. So that's the thing, right? We collect these contributions using all kinds of different technologies. And we give some names to them and we organize them and we make them web explorable. So what is a crestomity again? It's not a t term that, that uh, we made up, uh, but it's a term that we already use for a while. It's pretty cool. It's basically, it's coming from natural languages and there it's used for collection of text. Right? It's usually used there for, for explaining the culture or the, 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 some, some historical aspect of, of some natural language. And it also has become popular in a software engineering context. So I think this is something many of you maybe have come across, uh, Rosetta Code. Right? So this is really huge. I mean, this is about hundreds of languages, hundreds of tasks, programming tasks, and how they can be approached in different languages. Right? This is uh, actually explicitly also called a crestomity. Uh, our team also has worked on another crestomity 101 or 101 companies where we basically implemented uh, human resources management in system time and again with different languages and technologies and different designs. And uh, by this we also wanted to better understand how different technologies and languages compare. Okay, so in, in, a, in a sense this meter lipsing is just another crestomity but it focuses on domain-specific language implementation. And so what are the characteristics of a crestomity? Well, it's sort of obvious, I mean, because it's about many things, so probably not a single person knows all these things, so it's usually a community effort. Uh, um, so the software crestomities that I have seen, they usually uh, tend to involve uh, uh, many different languages. There is maybe also some designated infrastructural support that helps in collecting uh, these contributions and in uh, checking for their consistency. Um, yeah, there's maybe some metadata uh, to, to kind of add semantic knowledge to it. There's maybe some process management so that people know when something is submitted, accepted. Uh, revised, and there's also a reference specification. So here for FSM, it's pretty stupid, right? So for the finite state machine language, that would be like a simple grammar. You know, there are finite state machines, there are states, there are transitions. Or there would be a meta model, it's part of the reference specification. Um, or there would be a operational semantics that kind of guides maybe people who want to implement an interpreter. There might be also test cases. This would be a negative test case challenging well-formedness because in this case uh, state C is not referenced. Uh, there might be also a positive test case in the sense of what sort of C code do we want to generate from a finite state machine, okay? Anyways, so how did we build Metalib? This is a short summary of um, the process that we used, the methodology that we used. Basically, 
I mean, of course, we all had some deep understanding of uh, DSL implementation anyway, but we basically systematically looked at uh, some pieces of literature, and from that, we came up with a basic feature model of what you definitely need when you implement a DSL. And then we did something what's called theoretical sampling. Uh, that is, we basically defined criteria for including DSL implementation approaches. Because there are just too many, so we, we didn't plan to include everything, but at least we wanted to clearly understand what characteristics, what uh, parameters we would cover. So then we went on to implement uh, the finite state machine language with the selected languages. And, um, well, then we looked at the implementations and we tried to figure out in, in what sense they are different. And we used those differences um, to refine the feature model for DSL implementation. And we actually also looked at literature for all these specific approaches, and we used information retrieval techniques to come up with the vocabulary that we would need to use in order to annotate all these uh, new implementations. Okay, that's what we did. We basically annotated all these documentations. We used a model-based documentation approach to set up the documentation, and then everything is web explorable in the end. All right, so this is the basic feature model. I mean, this is really super trivial. Um, nothing surprising here. You know, when you implement the language, okay, you might need to implement the syntax, and you might need to implement the semantics. Well, when you implement syntax, you might end up implementing the abstract syntax and or the concrete syntax. Well, you always at least need a syntax implementation, otherwise you really don't have anything. You might not have a semantics implementation because maybe you're just playing with, a, let's say, a graphical uh, editing tool. But if you have a semantics implementation, well, then it could be the dynamic semantics implementation, the static semantics implementation, or a translation semantics implementation. And then there are some, some more options, some more obvious options that we just run into by doing this domain analysis on the grounds of some simple uh, literature. Okay. And then we did some theoretical sampling. This is like the summary of the theoretical sampling characteristics that we imposed on ourselves. So we said we don't want to focus just on very specific technologies like MPS or RESCAL. We also want to, of course, cover uh, how DSL implementation is done uh, with mainstream languages. We want to cover different paradigms, different styles like uh, internal, external. We want to go uh, for different technological spaces. And of course, we should cover uh, the basic feature model. And this is how we then got to this list here, which nicely covers all these dimensions of the theoretical sampling. Well, implementation development, of course, all the implementations are on GitHub. Actually, we didn't uh, uh, participate in the artifact evaluation process because our artifact is so scattered, uh, so complex, that uh, I think it's better just to keep it on GitHub. Um, sorry for that. Okay, so then we've got all these implementations and then we had to look at all the implementations, analyze them and figure out how to refine the feature model. And so basically up here in the basic feature model, we only had abstract syntax. And down here, all these uh, more refined features, these are features that we encountered by looking at the different implementations. And I will just show you some examples, right? So basically, here's a quick example of how we figured out there might be something like serialization. Uh, this is taken from an EMF-oriented uh, DSL implementation. Well, because we store the model at some point in an XMI file, uh, so this made us um, define the feature serialization. Okay, or here is uh, something uh, of a DSL implementation in Java where we use uh, a fluent interface and yeah, because we explicitly define an interface, we figured that we should have something like a feature API as a refinement of abstract syntax. Or here's something where we implement an interface in one way or another, actually committing to an abstract syntax graph rather than an abstract syntax tree, and this is why ASG is there. Okay, and there's, uh, for example, a Scala-based implementation where we use case classes, and this is really tree-based, and this is why AST is there. And while this is resolution, it's a little bit more complicated. This is when you have actually trees and graphs, and so you might actually need to write some functionality at some point to go from tree to graphs, and this is kind of pinpointing some relevant snippet from an X-text implementation. Well, 
and so on and so forth. And there's, of course, a nice matrix. Uh, the matrix shows um, all the features here and all the implementations uh, according to the theoretical sampling there. And the idea is that we at least cover each feature once, but uh, we, we, so we see some, well, we see that this is a case and we see also that some features are more popular, but let's not th think too deeply about this at this stage. Um, just want to say a few words about the semantic annotation approach because this is pretty unique to this um, Christomity. So basically, really, when you, in Metalib, when you go to the web um, and you look at the contribution, then you see many blocks like this. So basically, each implementation consists of code blocks uh, like this, and we have these dimensions of annotation here. So basically, we have the obvious thing, like, what feature is this about? So for example, this is about the API feature because we see some, we see some uh, Java code here that uses obviously a fluent API to wire up a particular state machine, right? So this is about the feature API because we use the API here. This is Java code. There's no fancy technology involved here. Okay, sorry. Um, and the fluent, the fluent API concept is exercised here, of course, right? So, and this one is about a perspective. So this is not an implementation of the feature. Uh, you know, this would be the most obvious thing that you implement a feature. This is about the data perspective that we actually look at data related to using the feature, right? And there's other uh, perspectives that I will not talk much about here, but obviously there's, for example, the test perspective that we are looking at test code that maybe exercises a feature. Okay, and this is how it works. And then all these concepts, all the technologies, all the languages, all the features that we use in annotations, they are documented on a semantic wiki. And here we just look briefly at uh, how we document uh, all these things. I mean, here we are basically looking at the markup, right? So one key thing here is we are not trying to reinvent the wheel and document all these many terms, the languages, technologies that we run into uh, again on our wiki, rather we apply sort of a linked open data approach, which means we are um, just putting the term there and we are connecting to uh, good resources. Like here we connect to Wikipedia and to Martin Fowler blog because Fluent API is uh, readily documented there, okay? And here's just a short idea on how we use information retrieval to inspire us uh, in, in kind of coming up with useful terms. So basically when we want to figure out whether we need a new sub feature or maybe not a feature but some concepts that we want to add to a contribution, well then what we do is for each implementation approach we use some key papers and we just use standard information retrieval tricks uh, like uh, term frequency and inverse term frequency and then we just eyeball the popular things that we get in this way, and we see whether we want to select anything from these, uh, we usually use the top 50 uh, that we eyeball, and then we see whether we want to use them in basically adding these concepts uh, to our uh, knowledge base, okay? Well, there's a uh, black cloud. Anyways, and uh, so the final thing here, model-based documentation, and this, this is something we learned from a sort of failed Christomity project. So where we basically ask people just to write nice wiki pages, um, and these wiki pages were just totally messy. So what we came up for this project here is we really have a very rigorous uh, model, in fact, meta model, for um, documenting the contributions. And the idea is that basically, you know, you have seen pictures like this where we project code and then we have all these annotations here. So these pages are obviously generated from this sort of model here. So you see here, okay, we basically point into the GitHub repository, um, you know, into a specific file, maybe into a specific line range in other cases, use different addressing mechanisms to point to uh, code blocks, okay? And then we say, okay, uh, we might give a headline to this, we might uh, identify features, uh, perspectives, languages, technologies that are relevant to it. Okay, and there's a nice meta model, of course. Anyways, um, 
Why are we doing this? So this is all about teaching in a sense, right? Learning and teaching. So we want to help people to understand different DSL implementation approaches and maybe also help teachers teaching about it, okay? And that's actually what the term crestomity means. Uh, its literal translation is to be useful for learning. Um, and so here's just a few scenarios. Like suppose you want to know, okay, there are all these DSL implementation approaches uh, exercised in MetaLab. Well, which of those use an API? Well, I mean, you just click in our nice uh, Web Explorer view, you just click API, you get a list of uh, implementations that use uh, an API. You also know where to find out more because uh, basically the 101 wiki, our semantic wiki connects to all the other knowledge resources, okay? Uh, if you don't know what a Fluent API is, okay, um, well, then, then indeed you just go here and you can find more information, uh, Wikipedia, Fowler, and so on. Or where is the API implemented? I mean, so basically, rather than scrolling through the code of a particular implementation, you, you go to this web view and you can go feature by feature and you could look at the relevant code blocks right there, okay? You can even compare different implementations, and you can say, hmm, okay, there's a, here I have a Java-based uh, implementation, uh, maybe using an Influent API, and then here I have a, um, a one that's fluent, and then how do they compare, and uh, to what extent are the differences uh, significant, right? This sort of question. Right, documentation approach, I, I showed you sort of how it feels, like it's model-based, but here's more like the high-level view. So the code for all the contributions lives, of course, on GitHub. The models, too, right? The models are just nice files. They also live on GitHub. And there's some well-formedness checking going on that, it, that the models of documentation really appropriately apply to the code. And if so, and if the models also conform, of course, to the meta model for documentations, then there's some automated web publishing going on, and this is how we get this. And from here, you might come to 101 Wiki, our semantic wiki, and from there, you might go to other knowledge resources like, one, uh, like Wikipedia. Uh, last slide, so I'm on time. Uh -huh. Never happens. Um, future work. <laughs> yes, I mean, the obvious thing is you could add more contributions, right? You might also want to add more features, so you might look at our feature model and might say, hmm, uh, maybe there should be more features. So the key thing is to, to do iterations with our methodology because we try to be not a talk about which contributions we have and which features we have, right? So this is why we have theoretical sampling. And, uh, but still, there's obvious uh, directions for extending this. And uh, so the information retrieval techniques that we applied here, that was sort of quick and dirty. Uh, I mean, it's sort of better than nothing, but there's obvious room for improvement. And I would generally say that in this community, uh, we don't really push the envelope what information retrieval um, you know, offers. So this might just be another example where there's a lot of um, gain from uh, IR to be expected. Yes, and cross-validation, I mean, we try to, we have like seven authors, so we try to cross-validate a lot. Um, but there's some obvious uh, threats to our approach. And uh, one way how we will approach this, rather than for you hoping to look at all this stuff, um, is also to use our own classroom to do more cross-validation and generally more evaluation. And that's it. Thank you.